Lord God bless us as we come together today to share in this conference. The Word of God goes out from Christ Bible Church in a very significant way all over the world. And I'm just amazed at that table over there. The Lord God is in control of the literature, and He can burn the truth into people's hearts whenever He wants to. And that I'm absolutely confident. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As we sang our hymn this morning, I was rather taken by the third stanza and a couple of phrases. Where the cry is, shame our wanton, selfish gladness. Rich in things and poor in soul. Rich in things, poor in soul. We have this idea of celebratory worship today, where going to church involves making people feel good. And if they feel good, they walk away like, well, wasn't the Lord good to us today? And if they feel bad, they're not going to come back. It's like the kid who attended one bag of church and listened to the rock music and so forth and came out of church and he said, wow. He said, what a fix. I can't wait till next week to come back for another one. And it was like he was injecting that kind of worship in his system and he was all happy and shamed on us, as the hymn put it. Well, uh, today I want to speak on the subject from the other side. Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll be all right here. And really, I need to back up a little bit. You know, we don't really know what's out there. In spite of all the exploration into space, and whether it's inner space or outer space, people are constantly searching for what's out there or what's in here. And I think they're going to discover something that is going to give meaning to life. And one of the ways in which they attempt to discover meaning in life is investigating the netherworld. So the title of this uh, presentation is From the Other Side. Do the dead communicate with the living? Now, if you were to ask me 40 years ago when I went into ministry, would I have to ever talk about a subject like this? I never would have dreamed that I would have had to talk or write or look into a subject like this. Mm. Oh, I recognize, uh, you know, there were few authors that were getting into this era or area like Merrill Unger and Haunting of Bishop Pike and so forth, but let me say to you that this is not only out there, but down here. And furthermore, it's coming into the church. Because if we use Israel as a paradigm as to how we're to cope with the world, we see that the Lord God, Deuteronomy chapter 18, warned the nation to separate from this kind of stuff when they entered the promised land. And when they were leaving Babylon in Isaiah 53, he said, you know, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord your God, and touch not the unclean thing. So that kind of spirituality is untouchable, or at least should be, by the church. The problem today is, as the New Age has begun to influence the belief system of the church, in fact, this book here right now that I'm reviewing on my website and on a couple of other websites, The Physics of Heaven, actually thinks that the New Age or New Age thought has stolen stuff from the church. And it's our responsibility to reclaim it. That's how bad this has gotten. And of course, one of the things that uh, the church has stolen is involving this subject. 1 Timothy 4.1 says that the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times shall, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, to seductive spirits. Mm -hmm. Whose mission in life is to distract Christianity 
from the Lord Jesus Christ and from the Holy Spirit and the doctrines of devils. I am beginning to see that the doctrines of devils are very prominent in the church today. In fact, it's very discouraging to me. My friend Warren Smith and I often laugh and say it's like that carnival game that you play and you got the heads popping up and you got the thing, you're trying to beat it down, you know? So something comes up, you beat it down, and then another thing comes up and you're just constantly beating stuff down because it's everywhere. It's mainstream Christianity today. It's like Pastor Tony Okoro said. He said the biggest churches in Nigeria are the churches that teach this kind of doctrine, false doctrine, mm. the doctrines of demons, seducing spirits. Demonic spirits that impersonate deceived loved ones, that is what we call familial spirits, family spirits, will attempt to convey new understanding and new revelations that will contribute to a new world view as to how we understand the universe. Dr. Oz is doing it, and many others via their literature, their television programs. And the church has now begun to follow suit. The paranormal is rising. George Newry and Rosemary Ellen Gully, by the way, I met her cousin at a meeting in Kentucky. They write about the new spirituality. To us, the evidence is clear. We already have the tools for establishing real-time, two-way contact with the dead, as well as entities who perhaps live in parallel worlds to ours, and possibly even with versions of ourselves in parallel dimensions. Hmm. This is out there. But it's not only out there, it's down here. James Redfield in his book, The Twelfth Insight, said this, if we follow the synchronicity, and notice he capitalizes that because synchronicity is the substitution for deity. The synchronicity, we will be able to learn from those in heaven in a direct way. And that will elevate us into the next level of consciousness, into the new consciousness. And the new consciousness is a consciousness that will not involve New Testament Christianity. It will be something else. Now, of course, this isn't in the church. This is outside the church. But wag the dog. I find that the culture constantly wags the church. The church really invents not too much new. It's the same old lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, satanic type of stuff that our, our Lord was tempted to by Satan. That's just repackaged in a different way over. Satan is really quite boring. He just offers the same stuff over and over and over and over again. But it's very, very seductive. For example, there's heavenly tourism that's so popular today. I can't hardly read a popular book. And this subject is not at least directly spoken to or maybe intimated. Nine days in heaven, the true story. Heaven is so real. Heaven is for real. Now they're taking and using kids. And of course, the boy who came back from heaven... This young man I saw in a YouTube interview where he denounced his so-called trip to heaven as so much trickery. He said his whole book was a fraud. He repented and he said, mark this, this young man, he came to understand the truth. He said, all we need to know about life after death is what we read in the Bible and get from Jesus Christ. That's all we need. Of course, Lifeway Books immediately remove this book from its shelves. And now, of course, there's Dr. Evan Alexander, who supposedly suffered a, a brain injury of sorts and was hospitalized near, ironically, Lynchburg, Virginia, at a New Age Center. And uh, he was a heavenly tourist. And so we live in a day of visions, voices, and visitations. These are very seductive, very, very seductive. And of course, it's common within the mystical Eastern 
religious vein. For example, Alexander says, the powerful and all. You know, isn't that interesting? Awesome, right? You hear these people say, awesome. God is awesome, 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 awesome. I don't even think they know what they're saying. To me, he's holy, holy, holy. The thrice holy God. Awesome, awesome. The power and the awe of the all loving, all loving. You got Rob Bell there, you see. Love wins. Everybody's going to heaven, they just don't know it. All powerful. Okay, we can buy his omnipotence. But notice the last phrase is beyond any words at all. That's mysticism. You have an experience, but you can't explain it. You can't put it into words. <coughs> mysticism and spiritualism go together like hand and glove. Now, I have an article on my website that's current, and the question I ask is, was Paul a mystic? So I delve into this issue to show that he was not a mystic. But my website is www.guardingisflock.com. It's the current post on the website. But Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body or out, I can't tell. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. It's not that Paul could not explain what it is. He was very capable of explaining what happened. He was forbidden to explain what happened. Because the Lord God de-emphasizes these kinds of experiences. That's the take home I get out of that passage of scripture. Mm -hmm. He didn't discuss it, not because he couldn't, but because he was commanded not to. Mm -hmm. From the other side, do the dead communicate with the living? So background briefly and uh, We'll, we'll go through this. You all know, I hope, Deuteronomy 18. You should if you don't. And I'm not going to turn there and read it right now for time's sake. But in this particular chapter of Scripture, there are certain practices that are forbidden that the children of Israel engage in or learn from their Canaanite neighbors. The rule was separation, not integration, not assimilation, not as they call what? A synthesizing of religious beliefs. The first thing that Deuteronomy 18 says, you shall not have contact with one who makes his child pass through fire. Now, of course we have abortion. It's not like we're taking our kids and throwing them into a fire and watching them burn and scream. You know, and a sacrifice to some god somewhere. But uh, we are aborting babies, young lives. So we're not immune from this kind of mentality or attitude, I should say. Deuteronomy 12, 31, You shall not behave thus toward the Lord your God, for every abominable act which the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. These are the Canaanites. Or they even burn their sons and daughters in the fight to their gods. It's unbelievable, isn't it? That people would burn their kids and actually think it's a worship? Wow. Hmm. How perverted can it get? Well, we're not too far away from that, are we? Right? That's right. When you look at the modern abortion movement, and you've got these videos that are out now about selling body parts and all the rest of the stuff that's involved in this. Yeah. I mean, are, are, are we not indicted by this? One who uses divination. This is taken from Harry Potter. Our kids at my wife's Christian school read these novels. Written by a known occultist. 1 Samuel 28, 8, And saw disguised himself, and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him, and they came to a woman by night, he said, I pray thee, divine, the Hebrew word kasem, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. Now, what I want to suggest is every one of these attributes of what the Canaanites believed and practiced is kind of hard to comprehend because occultism is notoriously secretive. They're not going to tell you forthright what they mean. There's enough mysticism and mystery. And you take, for example, 
Uh, masonry is an example. You know, you might get a little introduction from a mason about what the first degree is, maybe, but as you progress up the degrees, they're not going to tell you what they do because it's secret. In the same way, the, the attributes that uh, Moses wrote by revelation from God as to what the Hebrews were to do and how they were to react to the wicked Canaanite environment, you know, it's very hazy at points, so I'm just estimating here, okay? But there's enough truth, and enough truth in the words of Scripture that give us an indication of what's going on. Observer of times, one who practices witchcraft. An observer of times is me'onin, may be a reference to divination by reading clouds or other natural phenomena. The church I pastored in Indianapolis, Indiana, just across the street, was a place where you could go and have your fortune told. An enchanter, one who interprets omens. And uh, I don't think, for example, in the unfolding revelation of the Old Testament that some of the saints were completely immune from this because uh, the question is asked, is not this it, Joseph's cup, in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? This is something they had to learn to break from because the whole world was filled with occultism. In fact, I have an opinion, and I'll share it. I believe the whole Bible was written to provide the opposite of the religion that was in the world in that day. For example, I believe that Genesis is an apologetic, even in that day, against the chance origin of the universe, a mythological origin of the universe that was commonly believed by ancient people. And God told Moses, you tell them how it really happened. So Moses functioned as a prophet in reverse and explained to them how this universe came into existence according to the word of God. Divination by means of a cup may be a kind of hydromancy where reflections are observed on the water and the cup and portend future events. A witch, a sorcerer. The term sorcerer, kasak, is used for someone who employs drugs. It's the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek word pharmakia that's mentioned in uh, Galatians chapter 5 in the book of Revelation where it says they repented not of their sorceries. I mean, do you think we have a drug epidemic in our country today? They repented not of their sorceries. Is used for someone who employs drugs or herbs produce magical effects or altered states of consciousness. Sir Leslie and I co-wrote an article some years ago now, Altered States, a Different Gate. But that's what this is all about today. This new spirituality is experiencing altered states of consciousness. And I want to be honest with you, one of the great inducers of altered states of consciousness today is music in the church. That's right. A steady beat music that introduces people into an altered state of consciousness, and they walk out and they say, why wasn't the spirit with us today? No, it was the flesh doing its thing. It was the release of the Oxycontin and all the rest of the other drugs that are native to the human body, and that are part of a feel-good experience, and they confuse the flesh with the true spirit of God. I think Micah put it right. He said, I will cut off sorceries from your land. A charmer, one who casts a spell. A kabar attempts to conjure up spells over other people. Could be black magic, it could be white magic, and control them by his or her magical uttering. A consulter with familiar spirits, a medium. John Edward, who's a psychic medium, had a nationally syndicated television program. Well known. Crossing over, a medium, an O is one who serves as a conduit to communicate with the dead but actually serves as a channel for giving messages from demonic spirits to the living. The doctrines of demons, seductive spirits. A wizard or a spiritist. I mean, that scene looks familiar, right? That could be reproduced in any one of a number of charismatic churches. A wizard or a spiritist is one who is intimately acquainted with and makes inquiries, the Hebrew word yada, to ask of the demonic spiritual world. This is a guy called Bracco. All he does is stand up in silence in front of his audience. He stares at him eye to eye. They flock to him. 
Because in that staring, he is imparting something to them. And I believe he's imparting spirits. Gazing, it's called, eye to eye. One who calls up the dead a necromancer. The Hebrew for necromancer means one who asks darash of the dead. Now, you can see that one of the symbols of spiritualism is the skull and bones. You see them on t-shirts all the time, right? Kids walk around, this, this is spiritualism. It's everywhere. This is a Stanley Krippner, I, I think he's still alive. He's a psychologist who's written a lot about altered states of consciousness, hypnosis, shamanism, and parapsychological subjects. He conducted a, an experiment at a, at a concert of the Grateful Dead in which he involved the attendees in a psychological or a parapsychological exercise. And this was the verdict. Again, the skull and bones. At a Grateful Dead concert, at the very least, I guarantee the attendees were full of spirits. I have a book, a booklet called Drumming Up Deception. Pastor Tony mentioned to me that I gave it to him a couple of years ago. And spiritualism, and I'll say this, rock music, according to a Harvard anthropologist, comes out of voodoo. From Africa. That's the fact. The Harvard anthropologist said, he said, you mean to think that rock music came from the Puritans? He said, forget it. It came out of voodoo. All I'm saying, beloved, is there are spirits at work. And our young people are being seduced by the droves into the occult New Age religion. Music Alcohol, drugs, sex, and drumming are the vehicles by which altered states of consciousness are produced. I say this. Deuteronomy 18.15 talks about the prophet. You know who that is, right? The Lord Jesus Christ called him. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee. Why were they to, why were they to not pay attention or not engage and all these activities that begin to be uh, listed earlier on in this section of Scripture. Because the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. What I would say is all this stuff, are you listening to me? All this stuff distracts us from the prophet of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is anti-Christ. Do we understand that? Jonathan Welton has one article in this book, uh, Physics of Heaven. He makes an amazing statement, forward by Dr. Sidroth. I have found throughout Scripture at least 75 examples of things that the New Age has counterfeited. And notice what he says. Such as having a spirit. That's blatant, such as having a spirit guide. This is an encyclopedia I refer to often when I'm writing by Rosemary Ellen Gully. She says this, a spirit guide, the higher self, an angel, a highly evolved being or group, mind, or a spirit of the dead. So you know, this guy is a part of the New Apostolic Reformation. Recognizing the spirit is an integral part of what he calls spirituality. And she said, a spirit guide can be a spirit of the dead that is necromancy, something that is directly forbidden in scripture along with the rest of the stuff. Now I come to the present situation. There's a book that's been published a few years ago called Al Hart. It's the story of a man who lost a, a son who was just ready to matriculate at the University of Tennessee. Must have been a fine young boy. I, know, I had no argument there. I watched the funeral because I wanted to enter into what this man has experienced. I watched the funeral on YouTube. My, my bone with this man to pick is not personal. I want to make that very, very clear. It's based upon principle. I, I, my heart is genuinely saddened for this man and the loss of his son. 
as I would be saddened by the loss of my Marmisons. But notice the endorsers of this book, Half Heart, Bridging the Gulf Between Heaven and Earth. James Robinson, he says, the burgers show us how we can find life and life beyond death's shadow. Chuck Missler, Paul Young, who's the author of The Shack, Greg Laurie, who's a very well-known pastor here in California, and Senator Bill Frist. All of them endorsing this book. What does this book teach? The burgers show how we can find light and life beyond death's shadow. Now, I'm going to summarize what the book's argument is, and the idea is of the connectivity of the saints. And the argument goes, persons in Christ are never more alive and active than when they die. At death, and like Jesus, God gives them resurrected bodies possessing unique powers and supernatural abilities. That is now, right now. After you die, according to this scheme, you get a resurrected body possessing unique powers and supernatural abilities. My understanding is that, that does not happen until the dead in Christ are raised. And then we who are alive are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this mortality will put on immortality. That's the Pauline teaching, the Pauline doctrine. But they say they got it now. Hence they can have people, you know, traversing anywhere they want to go in the universe. Back to earth if they want. Our minds, the book says, needs to be stretched to the other side. The problem is, if you can't see this, your mind has not been stretched. To the authors of Half Heart, these Bible verses, Hebrews, and I would say this, they make a case, or try to make a case from the Bible, that this is a legitimate spirituality we pursue. They're very tricky. They use the Bible for this. Despite what Paul, uh, Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 18, they use the Bible to endorse these kinds of experiences. Why? Because they call them spontaneous. They didn't ask for them. They didn't attend a seance to get them. They just happen. Just happen. happen. That's their justification for it. And so the authors of Half Heart use those verses. Hebrews 12 will deal with them to indicate there's one family, one name, one body, and we're all eternally connected. Remember the word connectivity on both sides of the veil between what is death and what is not life. It's not unlike the Roman Catholic doctrine of the communion of the saints. I just came back from a trip to Georgia. It was the greatest really teaching experience I've had in a long, long time uh, in a church in Tbilisi. And uh, of course, if you're Georgian, you're Georgian Orthodox there. That's part of being a citizen. You're a real rebel if you're not a part of the Georgian Orthodox. And I could not believe how the Lord God brought to bear all of the things that I had been studying and interacting with through my friends, uh, Warren Smith and others. I brought this to bear on this seminar because the Georgian Orthodox Church is the flowering of all this kind of spirituality. But anyway, the authors call these experiences with the dead, whatever they might be, God nods. Because dead and living saints are connected in Christ, quote, our loved ones may show up in dreams or visits or other ways. And then the question is, who can limit God's imagination? I cannot stand that. Think that God has an imagination. The omniscient one imagines. It's almost an idolatry whereby we impart, you know, part of our being imagination to God. I mean, it, it's a deep subject, I know, but I'm very uncomfortable with that idea. Yes, the residents of heaven are personally present. They are aware and they are near. Personally present, aware and near. Now in the book, there's recorded a, a return of a young man, the man that died, the pastor's son. I call it Sea in the Sanctuary. It's reported by the then executive pastor of Grace Chapel in Nashville, Tennessee. This is after Josiah died. One Wednesday evening, Josiah came into the sanctuary. It wasn't like he, is, like he just appeared there. It was a sense of him coming into the aisle, and he got down on one knee, and he bent into my ear. He said, 
Way worth it, Mr. Jim. Then, as quickly as he came, he left. It wasn't that he disappeared, rather. It was a sense of him leaving the sanctuary. He had a sense of speed about him. Not that he was hurried, but as, life, as if life on earth was much slower than in heaven. It's a different place, a different plane. I stood up and went over to my wife and told her, Josiah was just here. About Sterling's encounter that day in the church's sanctuary, he must be asked, did he really encounter a familiar spirit? In the aftermath of Josiah's appearing, Rita Springer, a guest worship leader at the church related to the burgers, how she had prayed to God before the service. Father, could Sia come and worship with us tonight? Now, you know, I'm interested that the Spirit of God comes. The blessed Holy Spirit comes and meets us in our worship. You see the kind of crazy substitutes that people get when their imagination goes crazy? They're well, it's interpretation by imagination. So this idea of connectedness, because of the indissoluble connectedness between the church and heaven and on earth, glorified members of Christ's heavenly body are aware of and present with loved ones on earth. Because of unbelief, imagine, because of unbelief, Christians should not miss out on the comfort these familiar visitations can offer. In other words, if you don't look forward to these kinds of visitations, you're an unbeliever. You see the, the play around with words? Oh, we know something judge. No, they're judgment. You get it? I mean, they're guilty of the very thing they say they're meant to. In affirming their belief in the continuing presences of the dead, the burgers protest that they're not talking about channeling seances or mediums trying to contact the dead, something that the Bible forbids. What they call it is spontaneous spiritualism. Your loved ones may come back at any moment. You don't ask for it. They just, it just happens because they're present. Departed in Christ, central to the story of half heart is the condition of the dead. That... They're alive, they're aware, and they are active. Saints are alive. Of course, I believe. My mom, my dad, my aunt, who predeceased me are alive. Right? Do you believe that? Do you believe your loved ones when believers in Jesus Christ are alive? Huh? Amen? They're alive right now. More alive. And we are focused on being upon their life. The life they possess. They are alive. Since God is the God of the living, why do we talk about people in the past tense who have passed on to heaven and refer to them as dead? They are alive and they are forever and is in Christ. God, I'm not going to quarrel with that. What I would quarrel with is the idea that these people have the freedom to come back to earth to make visitations. But they're alive. To be absent in the body is to be present with those. Huh? The Lord. Does the Lord have a bunch of dead people in His presence? No. I will never be more alive than I will be when I'm in the presence of Jesus Christ. And I know what I'm talking about to some degree. I did not die, but I had a severe, massive heart attack in, in a town an hour and a half outside of Hungary in 2006. November. November 9, 2006. It was my 11 9 experience. I had to be defibrillated seven times. My heart flatlined and wrote to the hospital seven times. Uh, I was hospitalized seven subsequent times when I got back to the States. I know what it's like to be real close to death, to be thought to be dead. The people that were following the rescue unit that I was in when I was going to the hospital in Budapest, the rescue unit would stop and they expected the people to get out and come back and said, don't bother coming anymore because he's died. Okay. Now people say, what did you see? And your answer is, nothing. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. I didn't see. All I will testify to is I did not see any darkness. My uh, physical therapist, uh, my Hungarian physical therapist, she came to the room and she said, what did you see? And the guy said, nothing. They say you will be raised to heaven with this new and better body, and the believers who have gone before you 
already have that. So the resurrection has already taken place according to this scenario. And we know that's not true. We're going to receive the exact same kind of body that Jesus Christ received when he was resurrected from the grave. The burgers say glorified bodies are already. I believe they're not yet. I certainly know I don't know. I don't expect that my parents and my, my good aunt and all the other loved ones that have predeceased me that were believers have theirs yet either. They may have an intermediate body, I don't know. Like, you know, maybe Luke 16 tells us some details about that. But according to these, this idea that the spirits can come back, the body has a ability. It can miraculously appear like Jesus did. It can instantly disappear like Jesus did. And it can fly like Jesus did in Acts chapter 1 when he ascended into heaven. That's their idea. Appear, disappear, and fly. The Bible says, we're going to get a glorified body that's not yet. I realize there's differences in eschatology here, and my purpose is not to press the point. But we'll approach this from, you know, the belief that there is going to be a translation. I prefer, I don't like the word rapture, even though I used it. It's translation. When we receive our glorified bodies, it's going to happen in a moment, twinkling of an eye. What a great moment, huh? Yeah. Talk about the problems of the world right now having instant deliverance for some people for a certain generation. But I do know that the resurrection has a chronology to it. That the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we are alive and remain when we caught up together to meet him in the air. Translation and resurrection. All those in Christ will in the future receive their glorified bodies in the same blink of time. You, you look at this, it's a beautiful picture of the unity that with which God views the church, the Lord Jesus Christ views his body, the church. We all get it at the same time. There aren't exceptional people that get it before we do, or we all get it at the same time. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Because of the unity of the body of Christ. Translation is going to happen to everybody. Dead, living, at the same time. Now, saints are aware. They're active, they're aware. They use the text. I call it the crowd in the clouds. Earth below becomes theater above as these heavenly inhabitants become onlookers of how the lives of their loved ones are, been, are playing out on earth. So it's like we're all going to, uh, you know, to a Raiders football game. Where's my friend there? Yeah. We're all going to a Raiders football game. We're, we're watching the Saints play out. We're in heaven. We're watching the Saints play out. We should have said the more means. Wherefore, seeing also we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Wherefore, one of the elementary rules I learned in hermeneutics was, what's the wherefore and therefore? Wherefore points back to Hebrews chapter 11. In other words, Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, the heavenly faithful of Hebrews 11 serve as models for, not spectators of, believers on earth. And by drawing upon the example of these witnesses, Hebrews encourages believers, that's us, to be faithful to the Lord no matter what the cost, even martyrdom, because that is the Greek word martyr in the text. Witness is martyr. Faith unto death. Like those kids, when that shooter came into that, I don't know the soul of those kids. Up in Oregon, was it? But the shooter came in and said, are you a Christian? Yeah? Bam. A martyr. A witness. I don't know what their soul was. Are you a Christian? Think of it. Even those Coptic Christians, was it, that were beheaded by ISIS? You know, the picture of them in their orange uniforms and the black robe, the guys with their big knives or whatever. Martyrdom is common in the world. The teaching of Hebrews is to be faithful to Christ when the going gets real tough. Even death. Witness is the word martyr, not eyewitness, like Peter was of the Transfiguration. Not onlooker, like the Greek word blemma, when Lot saw Sodom. And not spectators, that are 
as when Peter saw the clothes of Jesus in the tomb when he visited after Christ has been raised from the dead. No. The cloud crowd, though they are many, they are corporate together, they form a singular cloud crowd. That they are witnesses does not suggest that individuals might separate themselves from the crowd and the grandstand above to visit the plain view below. <clears throat> now, I, I, I'm giving the point that I don't necessarily think that people are watching me. I don't think my mom and my dad are watching me. Oh, you know, that, that's the common expression, right? When, when maybe an athlete loses a loved one and I know he's seeing the game. Wishful thinking. But let's concede the point for a moment that they do observe. I don't concede that. There's a lot of difference between having vision from heaven of brethren on earth and making visits from heaven to loved ones on earth. How do you think of the Luke passage where, you know, Abraham and Lazarus, right? He couldn't. Abraham couldn't come. Separation. I like the words of Griffith Thomas when he said it has been tempting to many writers to speak of our race being run in an arena surrounded by spectators as though those who have passed on before are still interested in our welfare. But however attractive the idea, it is impossible to derive it from this passage. Now we got Abraham the Watcher. From Jesus' statement, you know, about, you know, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, uh, they say, that uh, saints are alive like Abraham and they observe us like Abraham observed Jesus. Now, a little bit of Greek language might be helpful here. Because as time markers, the aorist tense is like a snapshot of the action, while the imperfect tense, like the present tense, takes a motion picture portraying the action as it unfolds. So, if Abraham rejoiced to see that day, we would expect that the tense would be imperfect because it was a motion picture tense. To the contrary, your father Abraham rejoiced Eris tense to see my day, and he saw Eris tense and was glad Eris tense snapshot. It's not like Abraham was observing everything that Jesus was doing on earth. No, he rejoiced in a singular picture. What was the picture? I believe it was the prophetic anticipation of the coming of Yeshua HaMashiach. Abraham rejoiced at the prospect of God's promise, promise of world blessing, the prophecy of a progeny seed, and God's provision of his land. If Abraham rejoiced to see Jesus' day, and this is the argument of the text, then why didn't the Jews who claimed to be Abraham, who claimed Abraham was their father? That's the argument. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, but you don't. No, for boldly asserting that he was the light of the world, Jesus' enemies charged him with perjury, denied his heavenly origin, slandered him as a Samaritan, accused him of being demon-possessed, and picked up stones to kill him. If they had been related to Abraham, they would have rejoiced to see Jesus' day, not try to murder him. But in all this, Jesus' statement about Abraham does not support the idea that in some ever-present way he was spectating and rejoicing over Jesus' life. I quote Carson to that effect. Saints are active. Shock and awe, Saul, the witch, and Samuel. Samuel said this to Saul, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. I use this because this is the text that the burghers use in their book Have Heart to document the fact that, that uh, people make visits. Ah, well, Samuel visited Saul, didn't he? To support that the dead of Dead appearing to the living have hard employees the incident were in violation of both God's and his own law. Saul visited the witch to town of Israel. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. So we call this Saul's seance. He goes to the witch. He said, Conjure up for me, please, and bring up for me whom I shall name to you. Then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? You see, I guess Samuel was not as rested as his point. people might want to believe. He wasn't rested, he was disturbed, like awakened. Now, Samuel's appearance to Saul was not spontaneous. Saul saw it. And so the seance turned into a sermon. Samuel did not talk through the witch. Very important. 
Samuel directly addresses Saul. God's prophets do not use mediums. Samuel offered Saul no comfort. This is uh, Diane Archangel. She said about afterlife encounters. Qualified mediums can benefit the bereaved population. They provide evidence for survival of bodily death. Now notice this thing, which reduces anxiety. That's the whole purpose of spiritualism. It's to reduce anxiety. Samuel announced to Saul that the Lord had departed from him, that he was being dethroned by David, that his armies would be defeated by the Philistines, and that both he and his sons would die the next day. Not exactly consoling news for the king, was it? Samuel's unique appearance to Saul gives no biblical precedent for imagining the dead are present with the living. As the preacher and Ecclesiastes informs us, the dead no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. Dr. Rene Pash said none of these, none of those raised in either the Old Testament or New Testament times recounted the thing as far as we know about the experience of going from death into the court of the dead. And of course, then they have missions for the masters, and I'm going to just for, fast forward at this point because of time. And I really want to reach my conclusion. I think most of you are aware of the great gulf that's fixed. Notice the title of the book is <coughs> well, the gulf is between Hades and a place of called paradise or comfort. And really, it's a gulf that no Christian has a right to bridge. <coughs> it's a great fixed gulf, the text says. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great fixed gulf so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from here and there passed to us. And Abraham said, they have Moses and they have prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, and if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one should rise from the dead. Listen to this book. Moses and the prophets, the apostles. Or are you not going to care about something that comes back from the dead? Gives you some consoling news that's not true? Such is the nature of the kind of human heart. Job to his friends, as the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall, shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. The dead are dead. They're alive if they're in Christ. Now there's a technical debate that I'm not going to just come to the conclusion. Dr. Oz. How many of you have heard of Dr. Oz? You know, he's kind of buddies with Rick Warren. Right? Wrote a book together, was it? The Daniel Plan or something like that? He said, do you believe you can talk to the dead? And if you can, does it help to get over the death of a person? Would talking to the dead be the best medicine for grief? Well, I don't think it was for Saul. There's a book that was written, and I love the words of the author. He said, you know, there's a phrase that recurred about the attitude of the dead, or the attitude of the living toward the dead. And the living will not let them go. They cannot believe them dead. And the living will not let them go. The living will not let them go. They will not let them pass beyond. No, the living will not let them go. People will not let them go. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the great blessing about being a believer, isn't it? You know, you let them go. Because they're better off than we are. We believe that. I do. Paul says the sting, the chemtron of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. The sting, the chemtron, is like the, the what's that adder? You know, the death adder. You ever heard about the death adder? Mm -hmm. One bite, you're dead. Nothing can help you. Right. New missionary. Pioneer missionary in what was then Dutch New Guinea. Very, very venomous animals. That's, that's death. We're all dying, folks. We celebrate the culture of youth because we want to think we're not dying. <clears throat> so we can choose to face death by faith. Now we see it in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, just as I've also been fully known. 
But I come back to the prophet, beloved. I come back to the blessed prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not Muhammad, the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses wrote, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. All this stuff evidences a lack of people listening to the prophet. I have the words of the prophet, and that's all I need. Do you understand that? Amen. I have the words of the prophet, and that's all I need. So, are we going to listen to the paranormal or the prophet? When they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have a familiar spirit, not to wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living, for the dead, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And Jesus said, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last, the living one, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. You see what a wonderful thing it is. He's got the key. I, you know, I was doing evangelism a couple months ago, and uh, I'm, I'm just, look, if God doesn't save me through the grace of God in Jesus Christ, through his propitiatory death for my sins, and his physical bodily resurrection from the dead, and by believing that, if God doesn't save me from that, guess what? I'm lost. I'm lost. God doesn't have plan B. He only has plan A. That's it. And we got a lot of Christians out there, like Rob Ballard, saying, well, God has plan B, plan C, or how many plans does he have? This, this is crazy. Jesus said, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice, and shall come forth those who did good deeds to the resurrection of life, and those who did evil deeds unto the resurrection of judgment. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. This is the prophet speaking. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Well, you stop this? I think I'll stop right there. We either do or we don't. Lord God. Thank you for sending your prophet into the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, and giving ample witness through your holy prophets and for that your holy apostles who give testimony to Jesus Christ, vouchsafed to us forever through the word of God. I cling only to that, Lord. My only merit is Christ. You, God, made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin in my stead, that I might become the righteousness of God in him. Thank you for the wonderful exchange and the precious gift that you've given to me and to every believer. And then we will know that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.